coming Friday will be a 40-day journey that we've gone through in implementing life-giving habits in our lives or what it means to follow Jesus. And this morning, I am going to be pretty much putting down one of the most crucial ones of it all. If we don't take this morning's message home, and if we don't identify with this, then everything we've gone through over the last six weeks is for nothing. Now, I want to ask you if any of you are art collectors. Anyone likes art? Those paintings, those things that go up on the wall. I've got a lot of them. I don't understand them. Who, who places a price on those things? I just don't know. But, no, please take that one down. Take it down quickly. Han, put it back to that. Because this is, this is going to be the whole thing. Who, who, you guys saw the photo. You guys saw it. How many of you guys know what it went on auction for in 2017? Okay, I'm going to tell you the story around this painting. Okay. This was Leonardo da Vinci's. Now you can put it up, Han. Thank you. This was Leonardo da Vinci's Salvador Mundi. It went on auction on the 15th of November in 2017, and it sold for a whopping $450 million, which is the equivalent of 8.3 billion rand. Who has that lying around? Because we need to talk after the service, okay? <laughs> On Alexander Forbes' website, they stated this. As soon as the winning bid came in, a host of legal, logistical, and even ethical actions are set in motion for the sale of this painting. The new owner is bombarded with an incredible weight of questions regarding the prized possession that he had just purchased. Questions like, where will you keep it? Well, definitely not in my house. He responds by saying, I am going to be keeping it in New York, which will incur a sales tax of $36 million. So this guy's like spent 450 million. Now he's gonna pay another 36 million just to keep it in New York. I wanna see this guy's bank account. But then he gets asked another question. He says, how will you transport it? Probably not with our trucking services here in South Africa. <laughs> but they ran decoy trucks, booked multiple flights to confuse would-be thieves, and it seemed that in this very moment that if you bought a $450 million painting, that that painting has now become the center point of your life. And suddenly everything in your life revolves around it. Everything in your life is rearranged because of it. And this morning, this is exactly what happens to you and me, when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our life, He goes, He becomes the center point around which everything now revolves, and everything is continually rearranged, day by day, night by night, week by week, <coughs> excuse me, and when we understand this, what does it look like to become more like Jesus in our lives becomes a question that we ask. How do we continually turn to a new life? And if you're with me this morning, I want you to turn in your Bibles with me uh, to Colossians 3 verses 1 to 10. And it's our key passage of Scripture this morning. If you want to follow, it's on the YouVersion Bible app. Uh, if you want to follow in the notes that you received at the door, you're more than welcome to do that. And uh, we're going to read this passage of Scripture together. It says, If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and for your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, 
put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, like sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil, desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient, and you once walked in these things when you were living in them. But now, put away all the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Why? Because you do not lie to one another since you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. You are being made, being renewed in knowledge according to the image of the Creator. The church to which Paul was writing this letter was in the city of Colossae. Their religion said almost nothing about personal change. It was part of the status quo that a person would bring sacrifices, say their prayers um, at the temple or the altar, then they would go to the religious individual who was there <coughs> and confess their sins. And nobody would think this was inconsistent. For them, no response to religious truth was necessary. But then Paul comes along and he says, this is not so with us as Christians, as children of God. The new life has an inward demand and an outward response. But the truth of the good news of Jesus should change you, affect you, rearrange you, and transform you. That last part of verse 10 says, being renewed. Being renewed is a continual thing. The things that I knew are going to change just as that purchaser of that, of that painting. His entire life in a moment was completely changed to protect his prized possession. But often our value and importance is obscured because we value the things of this world more than we value our relationship with Jesus. When we give our lives to Christ, we enter instantly into a new life. But now a lifelong journey begins of applying that new life to every area of our head, heart, and hands. We turn to a new life every single day. So how do we do this? Well, Paul says this in the upcoming, that it is, um, it is by coming into greater knowledge. And the Greek word used here for this knowledge is speaking of exceptional knowledge, learning on the job, not book smart. How many of you, when you studied, yes, everything you studied was the greatest thing when you stepped into the working environment, like I've arrived. I remember hearing when I was, so I was one of those brave individuals in grade 10. I took accounting. I don't know what I was thinking. And the first thing that they said to us in our grade 10 class is, no matter what I teach you over the next three years, when you go to varsity, they're gonna tell you to forget everything that we taught you. So I dropped the subject. Then I went to go study theology, and then when I walked into church, I'm like, yes, I know everything about the Bible, eh? They taught us, if I'm ready for ministry, I can go in. No one ever taught us how to deal with people. <laughs> this is the exact same thing when it comes to understanding. We can have head knowledge of what the Bible says, but living in this journey and identifying and learning who Jesus is is a lifelong journey of learning who he is and how I get to know him and how this relationship with Christ applies to my life. And this morning, I wanna share three things regarding this. That when we come into this knowledge, many of us have a lot of knowledge of who Jesus is, what he went through for us, what he did for us, who he was, what he, what he sacrificed for us. But if we're gonna apply that knowledge to becoming hot, something that I accept, 
Well, then I need to come to the first one that says, I come into a greater knowledge of a new reality. Han, just use that second, second slide, the white one with the image on it. The photo will come up, it's fine, and then just click clear. And then that slide will be up and then everyone will be able to read with me. Why does it keep going to that? Oh, is it? Okay. I apologize. It's not, it's not Hans' fault. We've had some technical difficulties this morning. But if I come into a new reality, Paul makes it clear that as Christians, your whole reality has changed forever. This is now who you are. Christianity is not about trying to be a better person, but understanding that Jesus' finished work on the cross is for us, and we are because of who He is. Hear that again. We are because of who He is. As we read in Colossians, verse 4 says that Christ is your life. Your future is set. Being in Jesus through faith is now the truest thing about you. I can know about your hobbies, your eye color, your skill sets, your passions, upbringing, struggles, and victories. But none of that is the truest statement about you. What Jesus accomplished through his life death and resurrection is the final word over your life, the single unchangeable fact of your very existence is, is absolutely changed through everything that Jesus has done. And that is why we read in 1 John 5 verse 12 that the one who has the Son has life. The one who has the Son has life. I remember going on a sports trip um, back in high school. We went to England. And everyone didn't refer to us as the school that we represented. They referred to us as the South Africans. Man, it was great. We took the South African flag. We put it on our helmets. We felt like we were the Proteas playing in England. And every time we went on the ground, it was the South Africans are here. But every place that we went to, they made sure that we stayed in the best hotels, they gave us the best food, the best treatment, they even went out of their way for us. Nothing was limited to how the pommies treated us. Because the world judges our location. They were worried about what the South Africans, which are actually a bunch of teenagers that were let alone by their parents to go overseas, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> but if we apply this, that in Jesus, we have now been relocated, and Jesus is your new address and your new reality. Christians who grow season in, season out, are Christians who turn to the reality of what Jesus has done on their behalf as more true than any circumstance, failing, or falling that they may experience. So what does Paul in this moment say here about the truth of a new reality in Christ? Well, the first part is that you have died with Christ. Christ died so that the penalty of sin would be removed from our lives, but also so that the power that sin had over us would be broken. It would be broken to sin. You're a dead man fully alive now to God. This is our new reality. It is why 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and see the new has come. The second thing that Paul is saying to us in this is that you and I have been raised with Christ. This is important for us to understand because the ancient Jewish culture said that where you sat down, whom you associated with, 
This could be the rich sat with the rich and the poor sat with the poor and the old sat with the old. Or many of you that sit in the same seat every Sunday after Sunday. Sitting at the right hand of the host was the highest honor at a social engagement. Paul says now in Jesus, you've been given the most prestigious seat in all of the universe. And God, the greatest host of all associates, he associates himself with you. You seat at his right hand. He loves you. And that cannot change. This is your new reality. He says, I have seated you alongside me. And the third reality under this new reality that Paul shares with us is that your life is hidden in Christ. Hidden in Christ means security. It's not your performance or your track record that keeps you in relationship with God. It's the perfect life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. What is true of him is now true of you. The Russian nesting dolls. I wonder if we're going to be able to see that image, Han. There we go. These Russian nesting dolls, if you've never had one before, the smallest one would be put into the next one, put into the next one, put into the next one, and everyone gets into the biggest one. And the largest set that you can purchase is a 51 hand-painted set. No matter how many you take out, your life is a representation of this. You are in Christ. No matter how many layers you need to take off your life and remove of the old self, the ultimate goal is you remain in Christ Jesus. Just as these nesting dolls refer to the symbol, it refers to our lives as well. We are wall to wall full of God. And when we walk in faith, when you sit, when you sin, when the enemy attacks you with lies, when you suffer in life, you have to turn every minute and hour to the truth of your new reality in Jesus. This is now who you are, not who you want to become. You are a child of God. You don't have to become a child of God. When you accept Jesus, he says, I have seated you at the highest honor at the table. You now associate with Jesus, and that brings us to the next greater knowledge of finding a new rhythm. Paul says a Christian living in a new Jesus reality will engage in a new Jesus rhythm. This is now what you do. A new rhythm. If you follow the the drums, they can change rhythm at any time, but the rhythm keeps the beat. It keeps the band going. It makes sure that the beat stays on cue. The band knows when to fall in, when to fall out. They know how to sing the song. But in our Christian faith, a new rhythm, and I'm going to share these with you, and the first one is seeking the things above. Seeking the things above. The more we get to know Jesus, the more we begin to seek after his priorities in our lives, cities, and country. I no longer seek after self-centered consumerisms of financial gain unrestrained expressions of sexuality, selfish, unforgiving relationships, or comfortable living spiritually because I want what Jesus wants. And in any moment of my life, when I want to make a decision, the question is always, what does the Bible say about God's priorities in this matter? Every day, when I open up the Word of God, Every day I have to remind myself to ask this question, am I listening to the Spirit of God and connecting the people of God in order to seek God's priorities for my sexuality, 
money, career, family life, hobbies, relationships, future, and actions. When someone examines my calendar, my bank statements, and my media consumption, can they distinguish it from someone who does not know Jesus? He is now my savior and king. Now this morning you may say, wait just for a moment. I am not a free person now in Jesus. No, yes you are because you are free from sin and free to live as you were truly made to be. Romans 6 verse 1 to 2 says, should we continue in sin so that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? The second part of living in this new rhythm is to set your mind on things above. In all of life, I can now choose to set my mind on old thinking or I can choose to set my mind on God's perspective. It means that, the pract that practically everyday affairs of life get their direction from heaven's point of view. So why is this important for us to grasp? Well, Dr. William Bacus, in his book, Telling Yourself the Truth, said these words. The words we tell ourselves are more important than we realize. If you tell yourself something enough times and in the right circumstances, you will believe those words whether true or not. So, when I have sex with someone I'm not married to, cut corners on tax returns, gossip about a colleague, I'm turning to God's, I'm turning to God's perspective through the Holy Spirit. And when you are a child of God, we understand that God has chosen us. He is our center point and I am now a representative, then these actions are no longer out of a perception of a worldly perception, but out of a godly reality. I'm no longer fighting against what the Bible says. I'm fighting for a kingdom change to happen on earth. Jesus paid for your life with his blood. This action does not belong to my kingdom or the person I have to be. Acts 14, 15 says, we are proclaiming good news to you that you turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens, the earth, the seas, and everything in them. A Christian who grows and matures in every season of life is one who turns to new life every day, turning to a new rhythm of God's priorities and God's perspective in every area of thought and action. This is now what you do. And finally, when we come to this greater knowledge of living in a new life, we come to a place of a new response. A new reality in Jesus and a new rhythm with Jesus asks for a new response to Jesus. This is now how you and I live. What does this look like? Well, Paul says that you need to put to death and to put away what is not of God. So firstly, to put to death what belongs to earthly nature. Well, Paul mentions sin that represents our actions and attitudes, and God wants to do deep surgery on our hearts. These sins belong to the old life and have no place in our new life with Christ. Because we have died with Christ and we have the spiritual power to slay earthly desires that want to control us, then we come to asking the questions, what we desire usually determines what we do and our appetite leads to our actions. 
You need good accountability. You need good representation. You need a friend who can call you out on your actions that don't honor God. You need a family member to be able to call you out on your actions when you're trying to cut corners. I remember being challenged with this when I was listening to a podcast by Craig Rochelle, who shares of how his life in the past, he struggled with pornography. But then he was saved by grace and came to know the Lord and served him as a faithful follower. And not because he has a problem with it today, but because he never wants to have temptation stare him in the face again. He has put passwords, encrypted his entire laptop and his phones that everyone has access to see what his media searches are. Because he never wants to give the enemy a foothold in his life in that area again. You and I, we struggle with things. And when we come into this new life, we always feel like I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough. Or we feel like I need to sort those things out. Or I'm struggling with this thing continually. I'm not good enough for God to accept me or forgive me. Let me tell you, you have already been forgiven. You've already been accepted. And you're on this lifelong journey to discovering who you are in Jesus. And it's a lifelong journey. Sometimes everything gets wiped out in a moment, and sometimes things take time to overcome. But it doesn't make you a bad person. It makes you an individual on a journey with Jesus. Don't manage sin in your life. Put it to death. And that's why the second part of our new response is to put away ungodly conduct. And I'll be ending in a moment. How do I put away the things in my life that do not align with Jesus? Two things. Confess and forgive. 1 John 1 verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. James 5, 16, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is more powerful in its effect. When I sin and stumble, I turn to a new life by turning to Jesus and turning to his people. My position before God does not change when I sin, but relationally I need forgiveness, and Jesus says he is faithful. Why put death? Why put to death? Rather put away, because you have taken off the old self and have put on the new self. That's why we always refer to the relationship between Christ and the church as that of a marriage. A marriage is a great picture. On the wedding day, everything is planned, everything's put into place. There is a put off of direction, a new commitment, a new giving of yourself to someone because it is no longer you as an individual who's walking through this life, but you have chosen to walk this life with a partner, someone to share the memories with, someone who's gonna hold you accountable, that when you say sickness and in health, that day that you're sick and you're in bed and you've got man flu. <laughs> sickness and in health. That commitment is not just words being said at the altar, it's a commitment, but it's more important, it's a covenant. When we accepted Jesus into our lives, we made a covenant with him. And this is what I need to happen every day in my relationship with Jesus. The success of your marriage is not about how beautiful or terrible your wedding day was, Marriage is a moment of love and commitment that leads to life, to a life of love and commitment. Following Jesus is a moment of faith and transformation that leads to a lifetime of faith and transformation. 
A Christian who grows in every season is a Christian who turns to new life every day, who is working on God's grace and truth to align every area of their earthly practice to their heavenly position. This is now how you live. Out of this reality, out of these circumstances. Because often, it seems that if you buy a $450 million painting, that the painting becomes the center point of your life. Suddenly, everything in your life revolves around it and everything in your life is rearranged because of it. This is exactly what happens when Christ came because the Lord and Savior that he represents of your life is the one that I am living for now. He becomes the center point around which everything now revolves and everything is continually rearranged. As you take daily steps with Jesus, may you turn to the new life by continually aligning your earthly practices to the heavenly position you now have in Christ. I want to go as bold as to say, be careful to refer to your old life. Be careful to look at who you were, but rather look at what was to what you've been brought out of and into the position that you've been placed in. You live in a new life because of what Jesus did on the cross. It is a life-giving habit that if we apply to our lives, we are no longer gonna see this journey with Jesus as things that I need to give up, but rather things that God wants to bring out of me to be the best representation of who He is. I don't know about you, but sometimes this relationship with Jesus is hard. Times I wanna give up times when he challenges me and he hits me at the sensitive spaces. Those are the moments where I'm like, maybe I don't want to pick up my Bible today. Maybe I don't want to spend time with him. Think about the relationships that you have in your life. When things get a little bit tough, decisions are made that you don't like. You and your spouse might have an argument and you ignore each other for a couple of days. Or you and your kids, and they just don't want to listen. They do their own thing. They're making wrong decisions. You want to give them a five-fold ministry. I don't, I don't know. It's okay for us to feel like that when it's personal and we have control of it. But when it comes to Jesus... We almost want to dictate how that relationship looks like. Like, God, don't, don't challenge me on the way that I think. Don't challenge me on how I see my life. God, I want you to function in this box. But those things that I did back then, I don't want to, I don't want to even ask you for forgiveness because I don't want to pull that box out of my storage. I don't want to have to deal with those emotions. I don't want to have to deal with those scars. But until it is dealt with, it is always going to become a problem because there's those moments when that thing creeps up. You know, when couples, they go back, you always. Or you, you were like this when we dated, but you're not like that now. Until those hurts are addressed, until that pain is worked through, until that forgiveness is given, I'm always going to struggle. Maybe you've been praying for such a long time and and God has never come through for you in that area and you're like, God, do you really exist? It is a lifelong journey in understanding what God's plan is for your life. I discover new things every single day about who he is and how, how I'm walking on this road. There are times where I fail and I feel like when I get up onto the stage, I feel like, yes, this the stuff that I struggled with this week 
Am I worthy to be here? There are times where I question the position that I hold in, in, in our church because of the struggles I've had in the week. Because there's always gonna be a time where you're gonna refer your, to the old self. And when that happens, it's the enemy trying to distract you from where God is taking you. I don't know about you, but I don't know if you saw the trend and this is where I'm gonna be ending. On social media, there was this trend a couple of months ago where individuals were getting either tattooed or they were putting up on their statuses the number 41. And I started looking into this and I was, I was hearing the message behind it and it inspired me. So let me ask you this question. How many days did Jesus pray in the desert? How many days was Noah on the water? How many years were the Israelites in the desert? See where I'm going with this? Day 41, month 41, year 41 is going to come. That breakthrough will happen. But sometimes we need to be faithful in the seasons that are tough. Sometimes this new life that we've accepted, it's gonna take time to work through the challenges. But day 41, month 41, year 41 is coming. All that God says is just be faithful because He is faithful and just and He is fighting on our behalf. Why are we so inspired about every single one of those lights? Is because we're trusting for those individuals whose lights we're still trusting for to get to know Jesus and enter into this new life. That day 41 will come. The desert was not meant to break you. The desert was meant to bring you into submission of saying, God, I can only rely on you in this. Don't be like the Israelites who got stubborn and weren't happy with the 40 days that God wanted and ended up in 40 years. Because sometimes we need to listen. Sometimes there's areas of our lives that need to be broken down so that we can see God working in it. The Bible says that he is the potter, we are the clay. And he is molding us and he's shaping us. And he's got plans for you and he has plans to prosper you. You may feel like your, your jaw of clay is completely broken down. But there is something that an old Chinese individual, I can't remember the entire story, where what they would do is they would take that jar and they'd pull it together and they'll take gold and they'd put it on the cracks and they'd align that entire thing together and that's exactly what God is doing in your life. You may feel now that you're broken. You've entered into this new life you're following Jesus, you're doing everything that we're speaking about, but you still feel broken inside. God is taking every piece of that jar and he's putting it together piece by piece with the best material ever and he's aligning it and, and, and gluing it together with gold. It may not be complete now, but it will be. Just be faithful in your desert season. We need to put to death what belongs to the earthly nature and we need to put away ungodly con conduct. So I'm gonna ask us this morning if we would just bow our heads as we bring the series to a close but also this morning's service. You know, often we can get ourselves caught up into the way that we've always done things. We can get ourselves caught up in the way that we just know how to follow, follow Jesus. But when someone comes and challenges that, we get a little uncomfortable. And maybe you have not applied any life-giving habits and you've just gone as you felt all the time. No commitment. This morning I want to ask you that you have a deep introspection into your relationship with Jesus. Asking those questions. Have I submitted to this new life that Jesus has given me? Have I opened myself up to the truth that I, ha that I have been forgiven, that I am seated at the most holiest and highest place and that is right next to him? Is he the center of my focus? Or just partially? 
Maybe today you need realignment and you want to say, Lord Jesus, today I have steered in my own direction. I have gone on my own path. But this morning I'm making a commitment to allowing this new life giving habit of accepting this new life in Jesus. This is my priority. This morning I want to pray for you. And if you've been struggling with this, you want to allow this habit to be a priority. I just want you to raise your hand this morning as I pray with you. I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front. I just want to pray with you where you're at. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Many hands going up here this morning. Many hands going up here this morning. You can put those hands down and I want you just in your heart to pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you that you are seated at the right hand of the Father. But thank you that you took it a step further and you said that I am seated there with you. Thank you that I'm forgiven. Thank you that I'm accepted. Thank you that my old life does not hold me back from this new life that you have in store for me. Today I make a commitment to not only make you the center point of my life, but to daily remind myself to live in this new life that you have given me. Not to allow the enemy's lies to hold me back or to make me feel unworthy. But today, to walk in your freedom, to walk in this new life. And as we see the jar, I just want to read a passage of scripture with our eyes closed. And if you remember it, it's Psalm 1. Psalm 1 says this. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the steps with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yield fruit in season and whose leaves do not wither Whatever they do prospers. This morning, I want to encourage you to plant yourself in that living stream that the psalm talks about. That everything you do will prosper. That every leaf that you bear will not wither, but produce a fruit in and out of every season. So Lord Jesus, this morning for every single one of us gathered here, I want to say thank you for the sacrifice that you paid on the cross. I thank you that we now live in the victory story of Jesus Christ. I thank you that we celebrate in who you are, that we this morning can say thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have given us a new life and that our identity is firmly secured in you. But I pray this morning, Lord Jesus, that we would allow our lives to be planted in your living water. That we'd allow our lives to represent your truth. That we'd allow our lives to produce a fruit that can only come from you. Because there is nothing greater that we pursue than a relationship with you and being who you have called us to be and that is your disciples. I thank you for your blessing upon our lives. I thank you for every single person that has been with us on this journey. And may these life-giving habits that we are applying to our lives bring fruit in the season we find ourselves in. I'm trusting for day 41, month 41, year 41. Because our breakthrough is around the corner. Your plans for our lives are around the corner. And I declare that this morning in your wonderful, most precious name. And all God's people said,
Amen. It's been an absolute privilege sharing these messages and taking you along on this journey. And if you've missed any of it, it's available online. But remind yourself of how important it is to apply these life-giving habits to your life. 